Hi everybody, welcome to our next lecture. And this lecture is going to focus on bonds, equities, and interest rates. So we've got a lot packed into this lecture. Um, the, the roadmap for what we'll be discussing is as follows. We'll start by looking at bonds. And I'm going to provide some definitions, talk a little bit about issuers and holders, uh, provide some examples, and then we're going to really focus on the valuation of bonds. Uh, and then I'll take a, a couple minutes and talk about interest rates, which are inextricably linked to bonds. And then finally, we'll spend uh, a little bit of time on equities by defining them, talk a little bit about the stock markets, and then valuing equities, and then some conclusions on equities. Okay, so let's begin. All right, let me start with a basic definition of bonds. We can think of a bond as a type of a security instrument that's used to raise capital by an issuing party or an issuer. A bond typically has the following characteristics. It's got a principal amount, which is to be repaid on a specific date in the future. This is also known as the face value or the par value. The payment date is known as the maturity date. Um, and many bonds have regular coupon payments, which are paid out either annually or semi-annually or quarterly, depending on the nature of the bond. The coupon rate is the interest rate used to calculate the coupon payment and is a percentage of the principal amount. So, for example, the coupon payment is just going to be the coupon rates times the principal. And I'll give an example of this in a little bit. Um, so a bond is a legal debt obligation. Failure to make payments as required can result in legal recourse by the, by the bond holders. A bond, these are just some additional features. A bond can be callable by the issuer. If, uh, if the issuer, given certain parameters uh, that were agreed upon when the bonds were first created, uh, a, a bond issuer may be able to require the person holding the bonds to return them to the issuer. Um, typically, the issuer is going to have to pay some type of penalty for this kind of an early recall. Uh, and then there's other features, many other features actually, that bonds can have. Let's just talk a little bit about who issues bonds or the issuing party. Right, this is the party that has made the payment, uh, the, you know, the, the promises to pay such and such based on the bond's spe uh, specifics. So the issuance of a bond is known as a bond offering. Um, the holding party, or the bond holder, is the party who currently has possession of the bond. Right? We've got the issuer and the holder. The holding party receives the payment from the issuer, if they're coupon payments or the final principal payment. Typically, the holding party can freely sell the bond to a third party, and all the rights will transfer. There are very active bond markets, for example. So you can think of a bond as essentially just, just a loan. It's a type of a loan. There's a principal and an interest amount. All right, so here's a quick recap of the definitions. There's a principal or face value. There's a maturity date, a coupon rate, coupon payments. Bonds are legal debt obligations. They could be callable. There's the issuing party or the issuer, the bond offering, holding party, etc. Let me talk a little bit more about issuers. So who are these people? Bonds are issued by various types of parties. So, for example, the federal government, the U.S. government, right, this is in the news a lot of all the debt that the U.S. government has, these are related to bonds. And the federal government issues bonds when there's tax revenue, when there's revenue shortfall, right, when the taxes don't cover all the expenses. Uh, state and municipal governments will issue bonds when they have specific projects, if they want to. Uh, fix a road or build a structure, for example, they might issue bonds. 
corporations issue bonds. Um, and then you'll see bonds related to the money markets. Uh, there's also more complex bonds like mortgage-backed or asset-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and so on. Right. So let's talk about who are the bondholders. Those are the issuers. Right. All these are the issuers. And now who are the bondholders? Well, there are a variety of people who hold bonds. Um, pension funds, right? They basically you buy bonds typically when you're trying to preserve long-term value. That's a, a common reason to buy bonds. Um, so pension funds want to preserve value over long periods of time. Insurance companies, right? They want to they want to save for that rainy day or the fiery day when they have to make payments. University endowments are large buyers or holders of bonds. Uh, there are bond funds, for example. Uh, individuals might buy bonds, and so on. So I want to give an example of the magnitude of the bond market with respect to equities. Uh, so the bond market is it's really enormous. It's a, it's a large market globally. Uh, this was uh, this, these data are a little bit old, um, but as of 2009, the face value of total bonds outstanding globally was about 82 trillion. I think uh, as of 2012, it's more like 110 trillion. It was depressed a little during the recession. Um, but compared to equities, equities, global equity stocks uh, was about 44 trillion. So it's almost twice as much debt out in the world as equity. So it's a, these, are big, these are big markets. These are very important financial securities. Just uh, as another example, total, U, total global GDP in 2010 was roughly 62 trillion. So there is 25% you know, more debt than the, the, the world generated in GDP for what that's worth. And by the way, the US, uh, to put this into context, the U.S. GDP at the same period was 14 and a half, roughly 15 trillion dollars, or, or almost a quarter of the world's GDP. So, you know, there's a reason that the U.S. is such a, a an important country in the world, right? Such a powerful country, really. It's got a quarter of all global GDP that it's generating. Um, visually, you can see there's. You know, twice as much debt as equity. So this is, this is one of the reasons why this is such an important area in finance. All right, so here's an example. Um, a company wants to raise money for a new project and it decides to do so by issuing bonds. And the characteristics of the bonds are as follows. So the, the bonds have a principal or face amount of $1,000. The maturity date is in five years and there's a coupon rate of 5%. So the coupon payments are made annually at the end of the year. Um, so the coupon payment, what is that gonna be? It's the face value times the coupon rate, right? The principal times the coupon rate, which is simply $1,000 times 5% or $50. So every year at the end of the year, the company's gonna pay $50 to the bondholder. Um, so just, no, we're discussing the characteristics at an individual bond level. This is just one bond. Um, but companies don't just issue one bond. They, they will issue a large tranche of bonds. So maybe they, uh, maybe in this example, the company is issuing, they're trying to raise a million dollars. So they issue a thousand of these bonds. Um, even that small, but you know, as an example. So in this case, if they were issuing a thousand, that means you know a thousand bonds times a thousand dollars is a million dollars. And uh, uh, if the bonds sell for a thousand dollars in the market, th then the company raised a million dollars. So that begs the question: What do bonds sell at? Um, well, the 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 answer is we're going to explore that. And let's just say. Initially, some bonds will simply sell for their face value. So in the case from the prior example, the company would convey the bonds to the buyer and 
the buyer would pay $1,000 to the company. Right? It was just sold at its face value. So now, assuming the buyer holds the bond to maturity, the buyer would receive five annual payments of $50, those coupon payments, and a final payment of $1,000 after five years. In other words, the buyer receives the annual interest payments and then, and then they get their principal returned. Again, this is, it's just a loan. So now let's talk more specifically about valuation for bonds. And you'll see how this relates to the time value of money that we developed in our earlier lecture. All right, so in the previous slide, I said that some of the bonds are issued at a price equal to their face value. So now many bonds are issued at a price that's either higher or lower than their face value. So ultimately, how does this work? Ultimately, the market, supply and demand, right, de determines a bond's price. So sometimes bondholders are willing to pay more than face value, and other times they're willing to pay less. So uh, we, can, we can make sense of what I'm saying by using the time value of money technique to try and value this stuff. Um, so the issuing party, we, we look at this from the perspective of the issuing party, and the issuing party specifies how much and when they're going to make the payments. Uh, the market then applies an interest rate which discounts the specified payments to the present. So let's take a look at our prior example. We've got a face value of $1,000 to be made in five years, right? Uh, coupon rate of 5%, $50. And here's our timeline. We've got five years. We know years one, two, three, and four, $50 is being paid out. And then in year five, there's another 50 plus the $1,000 of face value. And our question is, is how much is this worth today? What is a buyer, what's a fair market price? What's a buyer willing to pay to receive $50 next year and then $50 the year after that and so on? through year five, and then they get their $1,000 back. All right, so this is just a time value of money calculation. All right, let me start it on a different slide. And now, well, in order to answer this, we know from our time value of money talk that we need to discount this. So let's just say we have uh, an interest rate of 5%. Now, just as an aside, um, I'm really, these are really, uh, the I equals 5%. The terminology, I should really change this um, to differentiate from the coupon rate and then this discount rate. We're starting to get a little more rates into our expl explanations, and it can be a little confusing. So this I equals 5%, this is our discount rate. Right? This is the denominator of our time value of money equation, uh, which is completely different from our coupon rate. The company specifies the coupon rate, and the market, or the buyer, specifies what they believe is an appropriate discount rate. So let's just say an appropriate discount rate is 5%. Uh, and here's a spreadsheet of the TVM analysis for this. All right, we've got years 0 through 5, our payments, $50, $50, and so on, through 1050 um, we have to take the present value interest factor or calculate the present value interest factor. We have to discount those payments. Right? And you can see over time, uh, the $50 becomes worth less and less over time. And, you know, and then in year five, the $1,000.50 is only worth 823 today. That's based on this discount rate of 5%. When you add up all the present values, when you add up all this stuff, you get $1,000. So that's actually interesting, right? This is the face value. So in this case, the bond, the buyers of the bonds, the bond holders, would be willing to pay $1,000 if they believed an accurate discount rate for this promise of, uh, you know, for, from this issuer for these payments was uh, $1,000. So, you know, company X says, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay you this, um, these amounts. 
and the and the buyer the bondholder says okay well I'll discount that at 5% and I'm willing to pay you $1,000. So now, uh, just to recap, right? So, the, so based on the TVM, we'd be willing to pay $1,000 to receive five annual payments of $5 and a final payment of $1,000 after five years, assuming an interest rate. Again, this is a discount rate of 5%. When the bond valuation that's the price of the bond today, is equal to the face value, we say that the bond is selling at par. That's just terminology. Um, so now, what happens if the market applies an interest rate, a discount rate, of 7%? How much would the previous bond be valued at? Well, let's do our time value of money. So there's our timeline. Now we have a discount rate of 7%. And we can do our spreadsheet, right? We use zero through five. There's our payments. And now our interest rates, our interest factors are, uh, you know, they've changed. And the present values of each of these is less. So if you add it all up, the present, the total present value is $918. So we would be willing to pay $918 today for this promise of payments. All right, based on the ti uh, based on the TVM, we'd be willing to pay $918 to receive five annual payments of $50 and a final payment of $1,000 after five years. All right, assuming an interest rate of 7%. So in this case, we say that when the bond valuation when the price of the bond is below the face value, we say the bond is selling at a discount to the par value. All right, we're not willing to even pay face value. There's something going on. Um, you know, maybe we think the company is risky, so you know we don't want to. We don't want to pay a thousand dollars. Will it really pay us back? It's promise. I don't know. There's, there's something going on. So now, let's look at the opposite situation. What happens if the market decides that the interest rate or the discount rate should be 3%? So how much would the previous bond be valued? Here's our timeline. Our discount rate is 3%. And let me just uncover the whole analysis. In this case, the present value today of all these payments is 1,092. So based on the TVM, we'd be willing to pay $1,092 to receive five annual payments of $50 and a, payment, and a final payment of $1,000 after five years, assuming an interest rate of 3%. So in this case, when the bond valuation is above face value, it's $1,092, we'd, we'd be happy to pay $1,092 and the face value is $1,000. So we say that the bond is selling at a premium to par value. right? That's just that's the terminology, but it makes sense. It's like there's some kind of premium. We're actually willing to pay more than the face value. <coughs> All right, so let me just quickly summarize these three examples. All right, here's our bond. Uh, we have a coupon rate of 5%, face value of $1,000. This is all specified by the company, by the issuer. Now, what happens if we have a discount rate of the following? Discount rate of 3%. The bond price today is 1,092 and it's selling at a premium. If we have a discount rate of 5%, the market applies a discount rate of 5%, then the price of the bond today is $1,000 and it's selling at par. And if the discount rate is 7%, then the bond of the price today is 918 or it's selling at a discount to par. All right, some conclusions on bond valuations. So first of all, we use the time value of money to value a bond's price today. I hope that that makes sense. And you can see how that all works. The time frame, the coupon payments, the final principal payments are all specified by the bond issuer. These represent the future cash flows from the bonds. 
Right. This is the numerator of our time value of money analysis. The market, the bond, these are the buyers of the bonds. I call it the market. These are the buyers or the bond holders will then apply an interest rate or a discount rate to the above cash flow to calculate what they view as their present value of the bond's price today, what they would be willing to pay for that bond based on their own analysis. Um, so just to link this to what we talked about in the time value of money analysis, uh, in the time value of money lecture, valuing a bond is really, it's the same as calculating the present value of an annuity, those are the coupon payments, um, plus the, the present value of a single payment at the end of a period. Right, it's the five annual payments of fifty dollars. Those are the that's the annuity, those are the coupon payments, and then the final payment, the face value, in, you know, in five years in this case. That's the present value of the bond is equal to the present value of an annuity of the coupon payments plus the present value of the face value. Uh, that's just another way to think of a bond. Uh, in an Excel or in a financial calculator. You can use the, the time value of money valuation functions the, to, to do this. All right, so let me talk a little about interest rates. I've been talking about them for a couple of lectures now, um, but we really haven't, ex I haven't explained what they are. I've just stated them, given them. So let's dig a little bit. Uh, you know, under the surface here. Um, so what are these things? So unfortunately, first of all, interest rates, as you've probably already surmised, they, it's, it's somewhat of a general term, and uh, it, can, it can change depending on the use. So you know, there are, there are, this is true in a lot of finance. There's, there's a number of terms often for the same concept. Uh, and there are many concepts that use the same name. So, you know, this is just a reality of the field. So whenever you're talking with somebody, you're reading something, and you want to make sure that you're interpreting certain terms, you know, the way they are intended to be interpreted. So in our bond calculations, the market interest rate, which was the denominator of our time value analysis, is also known as the yield to maturity uh, or simply the yield, if the bondholder holds the bond through the life of the bond. So, you know, in our five-year example case, uh, we bought a bond, and we're holding onto the bond for the entire five years. We're not going to sell it. So we're just co we're, we're collecting the payments, and eventually the bond's life ends, and we've held it to the maturity. So the, the yield that we got is known as the yield to maturity. Uh, and this is the discount rate that's in the denominator. So, uh, and I've been using this term. People use the term discount rate or the discount factor because we're discounting our future cash flows back to the present at this rate, right? That's straight from our time value of money discussion. All right, so, you know, to make it even more confusing, there's a lot of different interest rates in an economy. Um, the interest rate that the government is charged to borrow money is lower than the interest rate that I'm charged on my credit cards. Right? It's just uh, I'm a lot riskier than the U.S. government, so the U.S. government can command really good rates. Um, in companies with good investment opportunities and a lot of cash, Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, they're going to have lower interest rates for their corporate debt than companies with few growth opportunities and no cash or, you know, brand new unproven companies. Um, interest rates for the exact same security will actually change over time. You know, if you, if you look at a history of five-year bonds issued by the U.S. government over the last, you know, 20 years, you look at them every year, how they've changed, the interest rates will have moved you know, throughout that time period. 
So there's a lot of different interest rates, and there's there's a, and they're constantly changing. So um, it begs the question, you know, what what's going on? What causes interest rates to be what they are? Um, so I'll address that shortly and briefly. Um, the, the, the main thing is in all these cases, the interest rate is going to increase when a given risk increases, and they should decrease when a given risk decreases. Right? There's some kind of risk and return um, link, which we talk quite a bit about next week. Um, but the logic is pretty straightforward. Right. In, in the face of multiple investment or lending opportunities, if we're not compensated for additional risk, then we're always going to put our money in the least risky opportunity. Right. So we need to be induced to invest or lend to a riskier situation by the promise of higher returns. Um, so we can actually think of an interest rate. This is now I'm. Uh, we, we can think of an economy-wide interest rate, or the, the interest the interest rate, right? The cost of borrowing money uh, is a function of a number of different factors. Um, the prevailing market interest rates, something known as the real interest rate, inflation risks, or the inflation risk premium, uh, repayment or default risks. Liquidity risks, are we going to be able to, um, to convert our bond into, into cash if we need it? Is there an active market? Um, and there are other risk factors um, in bonds. A common one is reinvestment risk. Um, but there's others. And, you know, back in our example from the five-year bond, we, we looked at when the interest rates were three, five, and seven percent, and so now we can go back and actually interpret why is the why might the market be assessing different rates at different times or for different companies? Um, so, in, in this case, we can uh, we can say that we might apply a higher rate, let's say the seven percent, if we're concerned that the company might not actually make the payments. Right? There's some kind of default risk. Uh, so we want to we want to we want to charge a higher rate for using our cash. And that's what the seven percent is, you know, compared to the five percent par. Um, or maybe we're concerned that inflation is going to increase, so we need some extra compensation. It has nothing to do with the company. The company is great, but we're concerned that uh, the overall economy might be having some problems. So we need to build that into our cost of lending. Um, and, and the 3%, uh, you know, maybe we believe that inflation is going to be decreasing. Uh, or maybe we believe the company has suddenly improved its position and uh, we're actually willing to charge them less for our capital. Uh, in, uh, ultimately, though, the interest rate reflects some kind of inherent riskiness that we have assessed of the company. So that's all I want to say about interest rates. Uh, we'll explore them a little bit more in the next module, and um, that's actually when the readings are assigned. Um, but I, I wanted to address it a little bit here because I've been talking about interest rates and, and we really haven't hadn't unpacked them at all. All right, so some conclusions on bonds and interest rates. The lower the interest rate, the higher a bond, the lower the interest rate or the lower the discount rate, the higher a bond or really any securities price today. Right? This is, we saw that from the time value of money. Conversely, the higher the interest rate, the lower the bond price. They move in opposite. Um, high interest rates, now we can interpret this a little, high interest rates have built in additional compensation compared to lower interest rates. The additional compensation is going to relate to some type of additional perceived risk related to the underlying cash flow.
All right, so now let's shift gears to equities. We'll have kind of a similar discussion that we had for debt, but now focused on equity. All right, so let me just begin by defining this. Equity securities or stocks represent ownership in a corporation. Common stockholders are residual claimants, is what we call them. Uh, what does that mean? It means they have a claim on all cash flows only after all other claimants have been paid. So employees, suppliers, debt holders, government, um, and anyone else who has a legal claim to uh, something from the company, they have to be paid off first. So any money that's left over then, the shareholders get. At any point in time, the market value of a firm's common stock depends on many different factors, so including the company's profitability, these are the, the cash flows that we talked about in uh, lecture one, um, the company's growth potential, that's another critical, um, uh, critical factor that, that causes us to think about what the value of the company is or the value of the stock is. Um, current market interest rates, this is what we use as our discount value, for example, uh, and other factors. All right, so I want to just take a moment to talk about stock markets because the markets that stocks trade in really are an important piece in finance um, and they help us determine what an appropriate value is for stocks. So. Uh, you know, if these things aren't working properly, then it can lead to some very misallocation, very skewed allocation of resources in society. Um, so stock exchanges or stock markets provide liquidity, right? the ability for owners of common stock to convert their shares into cash at any time. Um, liquidity allows buyers and sellers the means to transact with each other, and it gives people the confidence to buy and any, their shares in the first place, and, and, and it, it creates what's called price discovery. So some examples of the big ones are the New York Stock Exchange, uh, the NASDAQ, uh, that's where Microsoft and Google are traded, uh, the London Stock Exchange is a big one in Europe, um, and then there are all the major banks have what are known as private trading floors. Um, so the largest private trading floor in the world is at uh, UBS, which is a Swiss bank, and located just outside of New York City in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, and uh, just to get a sense of what this is, this is their trading floor. It's uh, the size of a couple football fields. Uh, and actually, your instructor sat roughly right there uh, for, I did a, a, a spent a few months there back in this, the summer of 2000 doing a project. Uh, and actually, what's interesting is, is uh, this is broken out by uh, type of security. So this whole back half is, um, I believe this was different equities. Uh, and then you had different bonds. And then you had foreign exchange. So I was in the foreign exchange area, for example. And then within each of these, there are broken out into, you know, divided into more finely tuned areas. Um, so this is a beehive of activity going on. And all the major banks have something like this. OK. Stock valuation. That was really the heart of our conversation for bonds. And it's really even more the heart for, for stocks. So we would like to use our TVM tool to value stocks. right? That, we used it for bonds, why can't we use it for stocks? So for example, when, when we valued bonds, we discounted the promised future payments of the bond by an appropriate interest rate, right, our discount rate, and we, we concluded with the present value of the bond price, the current market price. So you know, we'd like to do that for stocks, but there's a problem. Unfortunately for stocks, the issuer, the company whose stocks we want to buy, they, they haven't promised any specific payments. Right? We're just residual claimants. So it's not obvious what values we should use 
for our future cash flows, right? the numerator of our time value of money analysis. We don't know what we should use. Right? For bonds, we knew. We had that timeline. Um, but for stocks, we don't. So this makes it much harder, actually, to value stocks compared to bonds. But it's not impossible. If it were impossible, then you know, we, I wouldn't have put this lecture here. So let's just take a first cut at stock valuation. Let's say we're trying to value a company stock in which we expect a dividend to be paid. Not all stocks pay dividends, but let's just say in this case it is. We can look at historic dividend payments to get a sense of how much the dividend in the future might be. Right? We'll use the past as a guide to the future. So let's assume that the company is mature and the dividends are expected to be about the same you know, forever. There's really no change. These are obviously these are likely to be oversimplifications, but that's okay. This is a first cut. So if we assume a dividend, let's just say the dividend is going to be $2 based on our historic analysis, uh, then what we're really saying is every year we expect a $2 dividend payment for each, you know, for one share of the stock. And we expect that forever. Um, so a $2 dividend, what that is, is a $2 dividend payment in perpetuity. In year one, we get two dollars. In year two, two dollars. Year three, two dollars. You know, and so on. Valuing this then is simply valuing a perpetuity, which is w something we did and saw in the time value of money analysis. It's just the the present value of the perpetuity is just the the annual payment divided by the discount rate. We don't do divided by one plus the discount rate raised to some power. It's just divided by the discount rate. So let's just assume a discount rate of 12%. In this case, the present value is $2 divided by 0.12, or 12%, which is $16.67. So the value of a stock that pays a dividend of $2, where we expect the dividend to be $2 forever, you know, in perpetuity, we'd be willing to pay 1667 today for that stream of dividend payments. We can call this, this is often called the dividend discount model. Right? We're just discounting the dividends. So we can build on this model. This is pretty, it, it's actually you know, we went from having no idea how to value this thing to actually coming up with a value based on a couple of very reasonable, although simplifying assumptions. So that was a, a pretty good first cut. So we can build on the model a little to make it more versatile. So for example, we might assume that this is an established company, but it's growing. So if we can estimate or make an assumption about uh, the growth rate, maybe we can update our analysis. So let's just say it's a constant growth rate, um, and then we can use the equation that relates to a perpetuity with constant growth. Now in this case, the equation would be the dividend this year times 1 plus the growth rate, and then we divide that whole thing by R minus G, or the discount rate minus the growth rate. And that's just the, the formula for calculating a perpetuity with growth. So let's just plug in some numbers, say our growth rate is 3%, and then we have $2 times 1.03 divided by the discount rate minus the growth rate, 12 minus 3. Make sure, you know, if you've got percents, make sure you, you don't mixed, you don't, you don't add extra decimal points somewhere, otherwise you're going to get the arithmetic wrong. Uh, and, you know, if you're doing this in Excel, make sure that you have parentheses around the right areas, otherwise you're going to get the arithmetic wrong. But assuming we get the arithmetic correct, the, the, the calculation is actually pretty straightforward. So this reduces to 
2289. We would be willing to pay 2289 today to receive a perpetuity um, with a, a, a growth perpetuity with the characteristics, you know, where it's two dollars growing at a rate of three percent forever and applying a discount rate of 12 percent. So let's just compare these two. When it was a constant dividend, the value today was 16.67. Right, one share of the stock was worth $16.67. When there was a constant growth rate applied of just 3%, the dividend, uh, the, the stock today was worth 22.89. The growth assumption gave us an extra $6.22 per share of value, right, which is or 37% more value, right? 22.89 is a lot bigger than 16.67. Um, so the conclusion is growth is good, um, right? and this is actually why company managers are constantly trying and encouraged to grow their businesses because it shows up in stock prices like this. And if your growth rate is only just a couple, two or three or four percent, uh, it has a huge impact in the stock valuation. So from the perspective, I say 37 percent, but actually if you look at it from the perspective of a non-growth company, 1667 to 2289, um, you know, that's, that's almost 50 percent more. So growth this is why there's growth built, the goal of growth is built into um, the private sector. So there's a lot of extensions in this basic model. We can really, we can really make it very robust, um, all from this pretty simple model. Uh, but the essential ingredients involve what we just saw, so we can you know, in this case, we estimated a dividend and we estimated a growth rate um, and, a, and a discount rate. Um, but some of our common extensions is we split them into two time horizons. So we have a high growth phase in the early years. Maybe the first four or five years grow really fast. Um, you know, we can actually specify what they're going to be. And then after that period, there's a slow but steady growth phase pretty much from then on out. Uh, and a lot of companies, especially new companies, follow this path. Maybe it's five years or ten years of high growth, followed by more of a slow and steady growth. And that's all that is. Uh, we just value each period separately, and we use the you know, prior methods and just add them together. Um, alternatively, we saw in, the, in Module 1, the, the, the free cash flow is, is uh, a favored way of understanding how much cash is available for for using to pay back our lenders and investors. So uh, what we'll do a little later in the course is we'll actually use the free cash flows instead of dividends. So we use this same kind of analysis, but in place of dividends, we put free cash flows. And we use that in our time value of money. Um, so you can really, and, you know, and you can you can add on lots of bells and whistles, but this is the basic idea. All right, so some conclusions with equities. All right, if there's any residual value after paying back all outstanding obligations, payroll, taxes, loans, etc., that residual value is owned by the, share, by the shareholders. All right, equities are bought and sold in stock markets, just like bonds are bought and sold in bond markets. We can value stocks by taking the present value of any future estimated dividends accounting for growth and using an appropriate discount rate. Um, and, you know, we could even say the discount rate then, uh, this model can then be extended um, based on more nuances of, of the details involved in the valuation. And that's for future lectures. All right. Thank you very much.